Hello, welcome to Highlighting Transferable Skills in the Job and Internship Search Process. My name is Spencer Atkinson. I use he, him, his pronouns, and I'm one of the Senior Career Advisors at the Internship and Career Center. And my name is Louis Kudo. I'm a Student Disability Specialist with the SDC here at Davis. Um, also he, him, pronouns. Nice to meet you all. Awesome. And so we're going to be um, sharing a little bit today. Today's February, 20, February 8th, 2022. I just noticed that on the slide. Um, but we're going to be um, also sharing this, this video um, with folks uh, asynchronously. So this will be able to serve as a resource for folks moving forward. Um, so we wanted to just mention a couple of upcoming events that might be relevant for folks who are um, finding out about this in real time. Uh, the networking event that we have coming up uh, later this week, we do actually every quarter or every year in February, um, the Internship and Career Center hosts this networking event called Diversity, Belonging and Inclusion at Work. And this is specifically an event for employers who have what are called ERGs, employee resource groups. Um, and these are organizations that have a structured um, support network built in for employees who have um, who have a variety of identities and needs in the workplace. And so I uh, wanted to just mention that as something that might be useful for folks. And then um, we also have our winter internship and career fair coming up at the end of this month. We do at least one fair every quarter. So definitely encourage folks to check that out. Here's kind of the objectives of this workshop. Um, we wanted to help folks become an expert on your own skills and how to articulate them to employers. We also wanted to identify additional skills uh, that you might want to develop. So as you think your way through, we're going to kind of talk a little bit about that. And also it'll help you know the skills that employers are looking for so that you can figure out how best to articulate those and um, market yourself and the skills you bring to the table. We're also going to help you think about how to advocate for your own disability and the needs related to that in the workplace. Um, explore your options for disclosing accommodation needs in the workplace, and then just become of become aware of a bunch of the resources that are out there that can support you in your job search process. So we want to start with just this piece here, which is the responsibilities of job seekers with disabilities. It's really important for you to be thinking about, you know, as you go into the job search process, what are the things that are your responsibility as a job seeker? And so one, first of all, is just to really be focused on the merits and skills that you bring to the table and just really putting those at the forefront of your process. Anytime you're applying, anytime you're interviewing for a position. Also thinking about the ways in which it is appropriate to disclose your, disclose your need for accommodations um, if they're appropriate for the position. So thinking about at what stage in the process it's appropriate to do that, in what way you communicate those needs. And we'll talk about that as we go, as we go through today's workshop. And then also just making sure to be truthful at every stage of the process and be self-determined and proactive in the way that you navigate the job seeking process. So just naming those things kind of at the front end here is important as we think about your role and responsibility in this process and then the employer's responsibilities later on in the process as well. Louis, you want to add anything on that? Uh, no, I have nothing to add on that one. Sounds good. Well, that's fun. All right. So we'll kind of talk through the skills part of this, um, the kind of how to how to identify and articulate the skills that are most useful for um, employers and most relevant to the job search process in these three steps. So first of all, understanding who your audience is, what the prospective employer um, needs and is looking for, and then thinking about your own skills and how to take inventory of those uh, throughout the process, and then how to articulate those. So what is the language you can use to actually communicate your skills um, to that audience that you've identified? So we'll go through each one of these starting with knowing your audience. So when you sit down to actually think about who your audience is in the job search process, keeping in mind that every time you submit an application, there is a, a specific individual or group of individuals at the receiving end of that application and they have particular needs, they have particular things that they are looking for in applicants and being able to zero in on those as closely as possible is really gonna help you think about how best to navigate all the steps that come after that. So when you think about your audience as that prospective employer, one thing to keep in mind is that 
you know, that individual or group of individuals might be a hiring manager, might be a committee, might be an HR representative, might be a recruiter. So those folks, you know, they have a very particular perspective. They may or may not know the individual kind of nuts and bolts of the individual position within an organization. They may just be sort of the first point of contact for a hiring process. But they may also um, be using an applicant tracking system, which is a system that, is, that sort of automates the application process of reviewing materials. So whether that's resumes and cover letters, things like that. And they're going to be searching for keywords that help kind of filter resumes. So this is a really important piece for every job seeker to know, to think about how can you um, maximize the sort of searchability of those terms within your application materials and think about how best to align your resume and cover letter with the job description that you've been provided with. So that ATS kind of knowing how to navigate that is, is kind of an important just competency to begin thinking about now. And then the other thing to keep in mind with this prospective audience is that we know from lots of different sources that they're going to spend an average of six seconds reviewing an individual resume. Every time I ask audiences this, it's like two seconds, three minutes, like there's a huge range, but really like you know, very few seconds is what you have to work with in terms of thinking about how to capture the attention of this audience. And one of the ways that you can really capture their, their attention is to make sure that you identify the skills that they are seeking and figure out how best to demonstrate the fit between what they're looking for and what you bring to the table. So when we talk about skills that employers are seeking, we actually have some data that we can use as a reference point for this. So the National Association of Colleges and Employers, NACE, um, is a professional association um, that works with employers to find out what are they looking for when they recruit from university campuses. And they ask this question, which attributes beyond a strong GPA do you most value when you're looking at applicants? And this is the information that came up in the top 10 of their answers. So this is actually really recent, just came out last month, this information, looking at the percent of respondents who said each of these qualities, problem solving skills, analytical and quantitative skills, ability to work in a team, communication skills, initiative, strong work ethic, technical skills, Notice technical skills is all the way down. It's like number seven on this list, right? So yeah, having the technical skills that are required for the job are important, but they are not the most important thing. And I always make sure to point that out, that all those first six that come above that are things that can be developed and learned in a variety of contexts, right? They don't have to come from work experience. They don't have to come from a paid job. They can come from a lot of different domains of your life. And so being able to think about more holistically where you might be able to show evidence of those skills is a really important thing to start practicing in the job search process. And then down at the bottom of that list, we've got flexibility and adaptability, detail-oriented, and leadership. So this top 10 list, I think, is a really important thing to just kind of have in the back of your mind. This list gets updated every year. And so, like I said, this just came out, but it doesn't change that much. Like when I was updating this slide from last year's version of this presentation, um, they just, they're mostly the same top 10. They just kind of shuffle around in order. So if you kind of stick with these competencies here, this is really stuff that is always gonna serve you well if you think about how to communicate these to a prospective employer. So, the other thing to think about when you're kind of considering your prospective audience is that employers aren't all the same, right? So you can't just send out the same application materials to every single position and hope that that's going to do the trick. What you really want to do is think about a clear understanding of that about what matters to a specific employer and figure out what's really most relevant to them. So you see that Venn diagram on the left of the screen here. What do you want to say about you and your qualities and characteristics as an applicant and what they're interested in? We have to find the overlap between those two things in order to demonstrate relevance, right? So this is where tailoring your application materials comes in really handy. So thinking about how can you add language from their job posting that communicates the most relevant skills and experiences? How can you find ways to demonstrate your fit for the position or for the needs of the company or organization? So this is a, a really important part of the job search process is this tailoring that happens with each application and each new position. So that requires a little bit of a fluency in understanding how to read a job posting. 
So one of the things that we encourage folks to do is really just start getting familiar with how to study all the different clues that are provided from that job posting. So you might go through and highlight keywords that you find throughout it, things that really stand out that seem like, okay, that's going to be important. I'm going to have to figure out how to demonstrate that. You also want to think about all the different sections of a job posting, because if you just read the qualifications section, it's not going to tell you enough information to really represent the strongest version of yourself. Because oftentimes, if you read the qualifications section, you know, it might say ability to work effectively in a team with very diverse individuals. That could be describing an accountant, that could be describing an engineer, that could be describing a nurse, like that's not enough information to go on in order to really be able to communicate your fit. So reading all those other sections of the job posting is really going to help you. So maybe some background about the company, some uh, information about the duties and responsibilities, go through all those different sections. And then you also want to start thinking about how to read between the lines on those job postings. So thinking about the nuances and, and the bigger picture that might be conveyed through the way they talk about it. So for example, you know, when they say things like be able to work independently uh, under tight deadlines in a fast paced environment, right? Like that tells you a lot about the work environment, the situation that you might find yourself in, in that job. And so really being able to read between the lines, you know, they haven't straight out said, this is a stressful place to work but they've kind of given you some clues to help you understand what it might be like to work there. So reading between the lines is something you can start kind of practicing with every job posting you read. And then once you've done all of that, you can kind of go through and annotate that job posting, make notes for yourself of all the examples that you bring to the table in terms of your qualifications, your skills, all the different things that you might be able to use as examples to point to your fit with the things that they're looking for. Sometimes though, you might find a job posting that doesn't really tell you that much. And so um, there are a few different sources you can use in order to help you kind of fill in the gaps, right? So you might use career information databases like the Occupational Outlook Handbook, California Career Zone, ONET Online. Those are three really reputable ones that the ICC really recommends. And those can be great resources to help you kind of learn the general descriptions of jobs similar to the one that you're applying to. And that'll help you kind of understand a little bit more about like duties and responsibilities, daily tasks, you know, um, training and education and experience required to be successful in a job, things like that, that can help you kind of fill in the gaps. And then you can also, you know, connect with your network. So maybe ask recruiters at the company for more information. You might ask, um, you know, at a career fair, what are uh, the people who are there representing the company from um, at a career fair and can they provide uh, helpful information? You can also do uh, informational interviews, which are conversations one-on-one -on -one with a person who's working in a company or field that you're interested in, where you get the chance to just ask them about their prior experience and about their, you know, past work. And so those informational interviews can be just a way to kind of gain more insight into the bigger context, um, gain more insight into the nature of the work um, for that job that you might be applying to. So these kind of help you fill in the gaps when the job posting is a little bit vague. So all of those things combined helps you have a really informed understanding of what skills are going to make a person successful in a particular job that you might apply to. All right, <clears throat> and the next step we're gonna want to take is take an inventory of your skills. Um, so this is really important for you to know what skill sets you have and what the job is also looking for so you can best apply that when you're applying um, and make sure those stand out. So what are transferable skills? Um, we have three sections here, functional skills, knowledge-based skills, and personal skills. So functional skills are competencies that are transferable to many different work settings, um, basic skill knowledge that you can just use anywhere, that you can apply anywhere. Um, Knowledge-based skills are of specific subjects, procedures, and information to perform, perform specific tasks. Um, these are usually learned through education and training that are specific to the job. Uh, personal skills are work style traits and characteristics that help a person perform a job, um, relate to people, and the job environment. Um, so you want to have be well-rounded in all three and make sure that you're bringing all three to the table and know what they are. So let's take inventory and what are transferable skill sets. So we have a link. I will pop it in the chat for everybody to see right now. And this is something you can look through um, later 
after after the presentation here it's a good little form of transferable skills it goes through functional skill inventory um, gives you step-by-step -step instructions and you know just help you list your top six accomplishments and just organize your skills and traits um, that you're bringing to the job so examples of transferable traits um, just a few of them are communication interpersonal relations research, technical, work style traits. Um, so communication, obviously very important for any job that we're gonna go into. Um, writing effectively, present, presenting information, facilitating discussions. Uh, when we go into interpersonal relations, we're talking about developing relationships, listening, um, how you're providing support and how you're working as a team. Work style traits are more result oriented. Um, how creative are you? Um, are you good at being diplomatic, punctual? Are you organized? Research, um, we're talking about identifying resources, gathering information and solving problems. And then technical skills, data analysis, coding and programming, social media. So specifically for my job, I would know how to use um, special education databases. Um, that'd be an example for something like if you're gonna go into uh, special education or disability services. So how do your skills connect to the employer? This one is very important because like Spencer said earlier, you can't just apply to every job with the same overall cover letter or resume. We're gonna to have to specialize these to each job that you apply for and make sure you're putting down the skill sets that the employer is looking for. Um, so we're gonna identify examples of your skills in action, keeping in mind the job requirements and the employer's needs. We have a preparation chart um, this is something that you can definitely write down and I would encourage you to do this for each job that you apply to writing down the job requirements and what the employer is looking for in an employee and then examples of your qualifications and skills. So you can use this chart before you apply to the job so you can tailor your resume and your cover letter to that specific job and it's also just good to know what skills you have that can apply to a whole bunch of different jobs. So are there any skill gaps? Um, there's no worries at all. We can build skills to bridge the gap. So we all aren't gonna always have every skill that a job's looking for, and they also know that, so don't worry about it. Um, but we can do a lot of things that will, will help us bridge this gap. Um, so we can do long-term volunteering opportunities, club membership, leadership positions, internships, part-time jobs, and additional course, coursework. So there's always going to be something that you can do to find those skills that you might be missing out on. Um, also, don't be discouraged about applying to jobs if you don't meet all the skill gaps, because you might have more skills than the other person applying, or they may just, you know, really like you and your resume and your background. So don't be discouraged from applying either just because you don't meet all the requirements that a job might have. And so real once passion. you have come to understand your audience, the prospective employer, and you have taken inventory of the skills that you bring to the table and maybe notice the places where you have room for additional skill development, then it's time to start thinking about the skills that go into how to articulate those skills to that audience, right? So there are many ways to do this kind of at every stage of the job search process, but today we're really focused on kind of two specific places. One is the accomplishment statements that are those bullet points on your resume. And then the second place is in interviews where you'll tell what we call SAR stories, situation, action, result. So I'll go into each of those in, in depth in just a minute here. So accomplishment statements, as I mentioned, are really those bullet points that appear on your resume. So it's not important that you can you know, read every little tiny fine print text on this example resume here, really just wanted to show the formatting, right? These bullet points that show up under each of the experiences. And this is where you highlight your achievements and your specific contributions, right? This is not just uh, you know, summary of your job duties. This is not taken straight off of your job uh, description. This is the things that are really, again, tailored to that audience. So thinking about the things you want to highlight from your past experience that are relevant to your audience that are going to be the most kind of transferable in terms of your experiences and skills. 
So these bullet points are the place where you provide proof of the value that you bring to that prospective employer, because it shows your skills in action, right? These are the examples of you actually out there doing the things you say you can do. So this is a really, really important part of your resume. And it's one of the places, honestly, it's one of the hardest parts of the resume to write um, and takes some practice. And so we always love to encourage folks to reach out to the Internship and Career Center, have us kind of help you think about how to craft the strongest resume possible. But we'll talk a little bit about about it right now just to kind of get you started. So accomplishment statements always follow a pretty um, simple formula. They start with an action verb. Um, and that verb could be drawn from the job posting itself. You know, oftentimes in the requirements or the job duties section of the job posting, it'll say specific actions. So you can use those verbs. You can also just like Google resume verb list, or you can look at the ICC's website. We have a list of verbs as well um, that you can use in order to provide the strongest, most impactful word choice here. You want to avoid really passive language like assist, help, responsible for, tasked with, because all of those things suggest that it was somebody else's responsibility and you were just kind of like in the background, just kind of doing what you were told. What we really want to encourage you to do is think about the ways in which you were playing an active role in each of your accomplishments. So that action verb then is going to be followed by some context detail. So this is things like the population served, maybe the time frame of the project or the task you were working on, the types of issues that were encountered, Wherever possible, it's a good idea to quantify, you know, use numbers to provide a sense of scope. So were you working on a team of three or a team of 30, right? Those two types of context details suggest a very different kind of work that, that happens in that environment. So thinking about those quantities as a way to provide a sense of scope. And then also, this is a great place to incorporate keywords from the job posting. Again, going back to what we talked about earlier with those applicant tracking systems or with those you know, six seconds that you have to really catch their attention. If you can make it as close as possible to the same language of what they use in the job posting, that way you can really make sure it's, it's clear to anyone who sees it that that information that you've got on your resume is relevant to what they're looking for. Then once you've got those context uh, details in there, be sure to also provide some information about the results of your, of your efforts. So this could be the actual outcome, or if you didn't necessarily get to see the direct outcome of your effort, what was the aim of your effort? What was the intended outcome? And then again, this is a great place to, to provide quantities or quantify things wherever possible. You know, sometimes you'll see things like, you know, if somebody was a social media manager, like it led to a 130% increase in followers, right? So that's a, um, a, a results that you can quantify. And then you can kind of provide language that signals the results statement. So that's phrases like resulting in, leading to, in order to, those kinds of phrases allow the person reading to understand this is the part that explains the results, right? So let me show you a couple of examples to show you what I mean. So in each of these examples, the action verb is in bold, the context is underlined, and the results is, is italicized. So spearheaded planning for a year-long workshop series geared toward educating the public on health and wellness. So we've got that strong action verb, spearheaded, the context of this year-long workshop series, and then what was, the, what was the intended outcome here, educating the public on health and wellness, right? Another example, presented to groups of up to 50 plus students in order to increase awareness of centers services. This is something I do all the time, right? So this is an example of something that I might provide. Um, and so you got that strong action verb presented. We've got that context around, you know, what was the size of the audience you were presenting to, 50 plus students. And then why was I doing that in order to increase awareness of the center services? And then this last example, identified and reached out to prospective donors to help fund after school enrichment program, resulting in $5,000 raised. So if you actually know a number like that, that's a, even better, right? Anytime you can say like, well, I know that the outcome was we this X amount of dollars, then great. Um, and one of the reasons why the results is such an important part of these statements is that it allows a prospective employer to see that you understand how your contribution is working toward a collective goal or a, an outcome that the whole organization benefits from, right? So even if you were just helping out as a part of a team, even if you were just an intern, even if you were just doing what you were told, 
an awareness of that bigger picture is a quality that employers value. So helping yourself kind of articulate those things, I think is, is really something you can, you can start doing now in any small thing that you've done. Um, and I, I hear this sometimes with people who are like, well, I was doing a research project. It was a 10 year research study and I was only there for six weeks. So I don't know what the results were. Right. And it's like, okay, but you probably, know or at least should know like what is the goal of this research study right and if you don't know go back and ask the professor you're doing research for so that they can tell you and then you can add that in having that additional understanding of the big picture is a really valuable quality there are some other ways on your resume where skills might come in um, in terms of the way you talk about your um, what you bring to the table for a prospective employer. So sometimes you might use what's called a professional profile. It's just a sort of blurb at the top of the resume um, after your contact info that describes your experience, qualifications, sort of the unique packet of information that you bring to the table, your profile, right, as a, as a prospective candidate for the job. So this is something that is definitely an optional section of the resume, but if you do include it, it's a good place to sort of put the greatest hits of what your skills are that might be useful for that employer. And then another section is the skills section. This is a very common section to include for students. Um, it's a place where you can show the things that you're able to perform with little or no supervision. Ideally, these are skills, again, that employers are looking for. Um, you wanna have a combination of some technical skills and some interpersonal skills. Sometimes people call those soft skills. I don't like that term, but you know what I mean? The, the language around um, teamwork, collaboration, leadership, organization skills, those kinds of things in addition to some technical skills, language skills, computer proficiencies, things like that. And then another place would be a project section. So if you're sort of feeling like, okay, I don't have a ton of experience from like work or internships, how else can I integrate some examples of my skills in practice? A project section where you maybe demonstrate um, evidence from a project you did in a class or even a project you did as a self-study, something you were just interested in exploring. Um, those can also be a great place to show skills in practice. And then if you have any kind of concrete things like certifications um, that might be relevant to the job, you can include those. And then um, if you're applying for a job that requires like design skills, then the layout of your resume itself is a, an example of your skills in practice. So that's one place, um, it really only applies to visual design or like visual media kinds of jobs, but that's one place where um, actually the layout matters as an, as an example of your skills. So when you're interviewing, you're gonna see tons of questions like this. Time and time again, um, in my professional career, this comes up every time. So you're gonna to wanna to come up and use SAR stories when you're being asked behavioral interview questions. These are questions like, describe a situation in which, tell me about a time when they wanna know how you responded to the job in certain situations and how you're going to. Um, it's, it's important for a lot of jobs. And it's if you have this laid out and you have these stories ready to go when you interview, you'll be a lot more comfortable and just prepared for the interview because they will ask you this. Um, so what is the SAR method? So the S is situation or challenge. Um, think of a situation in which you are involved that has a positive outcome, all right? Then we're gonna talk about action. Specify the actions you took to complete the task and or respond to the challenge. And then R is for result. Communicate the positive result of your actions. So we're gonna tell the story in this way to let them know what the challenge was, what was going on, um, how you dealt with it, and then what came of that, all right? And we only wanna use positive stories here, so keep that in mind. All right, so how are we gonna prepare these SAR stories? Um, so we're gonna develop stories that you can tell and explain with ease, um, ones that aren't gonna go into too much detail or that you just don't remember. Um, we're gonna come up with stuff that's ready to go in your mind and you can communicate that very well. All right, so the delivery should be natural and conversational, not memorized or rehearsed. And then we're gonna use your list of concrete examples that you created based on the job posting to create these stories. So ensure that you give examples that, most, that are most related to the position. Um, so make sure before you go into that job interview, you're looking at what type of job it is, what kind of skills they have, what, what you'd be doing if you're in that position to come up with stories that would directly relate to that. All right. And if you don't have stories that will directly relate to the job, 
come up with stories that that can be relatable to most jobs and most positions um, that are that would be a, you know show that you have made a good impact right um, and then these stories prove that you can do what you say so all they have to go off of at this point of the interview is what you're telling them and what they're seeing on your resume so you want to sell yourself as much as possible um, so several qualities that will be communicated and telling um, of the story right so the next slide your turn all right so after today's workshop um, it would be good to draft maybe 10 to 15 SAR stories around themes. So these themes will cover generally most of the, the themes that you will be asked for in the interview process. So um, how's your leadership, teamwork, conflict resolution, organization, um, are these skills gleaned from, and um, other key skills that are from the job posting. So if you at least tackle leadership, teamwork, conflict resolution, and organization, that's going to really cover a lot of these, these questions that are going to be asked by the job. Um, so you just want to be prepared for that so you can answer as best as possible. Um, I'll just add on to that too, mm -hmm. Louis. The one thing that you mentioned, right, that you want to make sure to pick stories that, are po that have a positive outcome. Um, and this is tricky because oftentimes you'll get um, behavioral questions that ask about a less than ideal situation, right? Talk about a time when you were working on a team with somebody you didn't get along with, or talk about a time when you had to admit to a mistake that you made and how did you deal with it, right? So situations where it's already suboptimal and you're then having to come up with a positive result, right? So doing this brainstorming in advance is really important so that you don't get caught off guard during a job interview going like, uh, I can't think of a time when it didn't go horribly wrong, you know? <laughs> so making sure that you have those examples kind of off the top of your head is really, is a helpful strategy. Yeah, that's true. They'll always ask, um, I feel like one that comes up a lot is how you've dealt with a very difficult situation. Um, for myself, I was a teacher for a few, like four to five years, I would taught a high school um, counseling works class, students were diagnosed with emotional disturbance. Um, so one thing I can use a lot is I had a paraeducator who, you know, didn't react right to the students and it was a big conflict. So just thinking about that and how, you know, how that conflict, how you made it as positive as possible. Um, so that's one that I tend to use a lot personally, and it's one that I know very well. And, you know, you just need things like that going into these interviews to make sure you're prepared. Yeah, exactly. Having those stories in your back pocket comes in really handy. So as we kind of think about um, the, the whole process of job searching, right? So we've talked a little bit about resumes. We've talked a little bit about preparing for interviews, but there's really places throughout the job search process where you have the opportunity to showcase your skills. So your resume and cover letter are one place. The interview is another place. If you're on LinkedIn, your LinkedIn profile is a great place to be able to showcase your skills. And LinkedIn also has that feature of being able to endorse people, right? So you actually have other people um, vouching for the fact that you have those skills. And that can also be a useful space for demonstrating that. Also, you can use what's called an elevator pitch, which is the 30 seconds or so just introduction of who you are. They call it that because it's the time it takes to ride in an elevator with someone, how much you could say in that time. So, you know, that's also a good place where you could just start practicing, like, what are the two or three things that are really those, again, those greatest hits that I want to make sure to, to touch on before I have the chance to, you know, when I have the chance to introduce myself to somebody. That can be really useful in sort of networking events, like the, the one that I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation at um, career fairs, um, those can be really useful. It even often serves really well at kind of the beginning of an interview, they might ask, tell us about yourself. And you might have a version of an elevator pitch that you use for that environment as well. And all of those can be places where you get the chance to really highlight the skills that you bring to the table in an affirmative way, in a positive way. Um, and we have a whole bunch of um, other workshops that the ICC offers that can help you also start thinking about, you know, how to articulate your transferable skills, how to make the most of this part of the process. So this is a big question that comes up a lot, um, came up a lot when I was teaching high school, comes up a lot now in college. When do you disclose accommodations when applying for jobs? So it is good to know that the ADA prohibits questions related to medical or disability. So you do not have to disclose um, unless when a government agency is asking for affirmative action purposes. Um, and then for those with non-apparent disabilities, so to elevate your personal anxieties, you 
really don't have to answer the disability related questions. You can leave them blank in the initial application. Um, that way you can offer your best outlook to your circumstances in person and disclose um, that at your personal convenience, if you feel that it's necessary. You might always not need to disclose a disability depending on how the work environment is or how the job is. Um, so just to give you the best chances, if you don't need immediate um, disability services or accommodations, um, it could be best to leave it out in the beginning of the process, the application process. So when is it an advantage to disclose a disability on a cover letter? So when the job is federally based and complying with affirmative action, um, when they're asking for it, when the job is related to a disability, such as a rehabilitation counselor, they might want people who, you know, have, have dealt with that themselves so they can better work with people who, who are dealing with that. Um, when having a disability is a qualification for the position, so this can come up, um, such as an addiction counselor, um, again, rehabilitation counselor, um, a lot of jobs along those lines can have, you know, they'll want somebody who's experienced it, who's dealt with it, who's overcome it to help other people. Um, so it's not always something that you want to leave out, it just depends on the job you're applying for. So in an interview, um, keep in mind, you have one minute to make a good first impression. Um, we've all messed up in interviews. I've messed up in interviews. I'm sure Spencer's messed up in interviews. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> so you have one minute, but it's good to keep going. Don't give up. So don't give up. Even if that one minute passes, don't give up. Um, and then disclose and disclose early if you do need accommodations during the interview. So if you need access to a building, adaptive equipment for written components of the interview, um, things like that, you should you should disclose. Um, be prepared for difficult questions. So gaps in employment, and then also make sure to keep the conversation positive and keep it going. Um, so always emphasize your talents, strengths, abilities, and other career forward attributes don't dwell on the limitations of your disabilities. So we want to talk positively, talk about all your strengths and skills and what you can bring to the position and why they should hire you, regardless of disability. All right, so examples of accommodations that you could see in the workplace. Um, these are just some general accommodations that you would see. And at the bottom, we have the ADA National Network. That website has also a list of um, accommodations. So if you don't know exactly what accommodations you can ask for, this would be good to go check out. So just a few, um, a change in job task, providing reserved parking, improved accessibility in a work area, change the presentation of tests or training materials, providing or adjusting a product, equipment or software, and then the use of a service animal. Um, that one's probably one of my favorite accommodations. <laughs> and then some other examples. So when we're going to talk about scheduling, um, modified shifts, reduced hours, flexible work hours, working from home, job sharing, split shifts. So these are all things that you shouldn't be afraid to ask for. Um, if you need these accommodations and you need these to work and, and do your best in the job, then these are all within, within reason to ask for and, and within your rights to ask for. Um, especially with today, with COVID, how everything is, um, we're seeing a lot more accommodations in the workplace. So if any time is the time to ask for it, now, now is the time. Um, we're also gonna look at modifications to environment and tech accommodations, so additional training, written job instructions, reduced background noise, these are all reasonable. And again, at the bottom, we have another um, website to check out Job Accommodation Network, um, askjan.org. This will also have a list of accommodations so it's definitely a good idea to go check both of these websites out if you don't know um, what you can ask for. So disabilities and job termination. Can you get fired for having a disability? No, 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 not at all. They can't do that. <laughs> so don't worry. Um, the federal government prohibits discrimination based on mental health diagnosis alone. The Americans with Disability Act, for instance, makes it illegal to terminate someone's employment for having a disability, mental health issues, or otherwise. So if you are going through things, if you are dealing with something, don't be scared to, to let you know the appropriate people know. Don't be scared to ask for accommodations that you need. Um, don't be scared to take time for yourself, um, for your mental health. Um, you are protected. 
So we've just mentioned two really great resources um, that can help you just think about, you know, what are the types of accommodations that you are, you know, within your power to ask for in the workplace. We wanted to mention just a bunch of other resources here toward the end so that you can kind of continue your, your learning and your preparation for your career development. Um, the ones on this slide here are really in it just to follow up on some of the things we mentioned earlier on in the workshop so onet online california career zone and occupational outlook handbook these are all career information databases they use um, national um, verified data sets um, that are uh, aggregated across the entire united states economy so you can really get very robust information about things like job descriptions the sort of level of education or experience required for different kinds of jobs um, different sorts of job titles that might be related to one another, how those things relate to different interest areas. There are some um, self assessments you can take on there to help you know about your interests and skills and have an idea of how those relate to different jobs out there on the market. Um, they also offer just great information about like salary and other things uh, along those lines. Um, and like I said, they're aggregated across the entire US economy. So you're also comparing apples to apples when you think about the same job description in multiple different localities or different types of companies. Um, we mentioned the transferable skills inventory. This is on the ICC's website. If you just go to our website and just search transferable skills, it'll come up. So you don't have to necessarily remember this long URL. Um, and uh, that's just a worksheet that you can use to really kind of go through. It's got a long list of all the different kinds of skills and tasks that might come up in the world of work. And you can kind of just go down the list and be like, well, I've done that before. And it might just give you a sense of like, oh, there's actually more things that I have practiced doing or experienced doing than I even realized might be relevant to the types of jobs I'm going to apply to in the future. So it might also just like add to your own self-awareness around the things that you know how to do. Um, we mentioned the ICC events and workshops um, a couple of times, and so you can check out our calendar for that. Um, the job board that we use at, at UC Davis is Handshake, so that's ucdavis.joinhandshake.com. You already have um, a profile on Handshake by nature of being a student at UC Davis, so as soon as you enroll, you also get a Handshake account. You just need to hop in there and then kind of set up a couple basic pieces of information if you've never used it before. And then Handshake actually uses data intelligence to help promote the most relevant job postings and events and things based on the things that you enter into your profile. So it's helpful for you to have a filled out profile so that you can make sure to get the most relevant use out of Handshake. And then the Student Disability Center, sdc.ucdavis.edu. Here's some additional career resources. We mentioned the Job Account Job Accommodation Network, JAN. Um, that's a great website for learning just more about, like we said before, kind of all the different types of accommodations. Project Hired is a great um, site for looking at kind of just like job search skills and strategies, but also actual job postings, um, you know, places, listings from employers who affirmatively hire um, job seekers with disabilities. And then you can also look within the, if you're looking at the federal government as a possible source of jobs for you, um, their pathways program and workforce recruitment program are specifically um, special pathways uh, to hiring for job seekers with disabilities that, for example, might, um, you know, uh, allow you to opt out of the written examination process. There might be other different accommodations that are, that are different uh, based on needs for a job seeker with a disability. And then there are some great professional associations that you can check out. A professional association is basically a membership organization for people in a particular field. And so these couple of professional associations are really great, specifically thinking about people in the labor market who have disabilities and how that might show up in a variety of different workplaces and being able to advocate for, for folks who are members of their organizations. So there's the American Association of People with Disabilities and then the Association on Higher Education and Disability is specifically around college going folks who are then entering the workforce with a disability. Here's just some more job boards. Lewis, you wanna jump on any of these and talk about your experience with any of these? Yeah, so these are a lot of good career resources um, for people with disabilities. Um, just a few, gettinghired.com, abil abilityjobs.com, um, all of these down here. I've used these, a few of these in the past with my high school students that have gotten hired through these. Um, 
my fiance actually works with adults with disabilities and they also use sites. Um, getting hired is great, ability jobs is great. All these are honestly great. Um, I would say just skim through all of them, click on all of them. Um, and they're great, they're great resources. Um, so I would just say, just click on them. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Cool. And so we'll just wrap up here by saying thank you for the time you took to, to listen in with us today. Um, again, my name is Spencer Atkinson. I'm one of the um, career advisors at the Internship and Career Center. We're available for appointments either in person in South Hall or also um, virtually through Zoom. Um, Monday through Friday, you can schedule those appointments in Handshake. Um, like I said, we are on this, the second floor of South Hall. Um, and our website also is an incredible resource in terms of just lots of additional information about job searching, about um, interview prep, about resumes and cover letters, about negotiating job offers, about navigating all kinds of different aspects of the career development process. So we really encourage you to reach out to us so that we can continue helping you at every, every stage of your career development. And if you're a current student with disabilities or just want to learn more, um, please reach out to the Student Disability Center. We're also Monday through Friday, um, about eight to five. You can stop by in person at the Cow Building, 54 Cow Building, or give a call um, at the number provided and you will be able to talk to our office staff. So we schedule appointments. Uh, we can take in information, um, documentation that shows disability gets you set up with accommodations. Just remember there's no deadline. A lot of students think that there's a deadline or a cutoff date for um, accessing accommodation and there's not. We can change, add, drop, um, get you set up with accommodations at any time of the quarter. So if you are looking for that or want to know how, um, if you qualify, um, just give us a call. Awesome. Thanks, everybody.